Welcome to Whining and Dining with Jim White. It's the program dedicated to introducing you to the people behind the flavors you love. Uh, joining us once again on the show, our guest gourmet, the founder of La Madeleine, Patrick Escaré. Patrick, welcome back, my friend. Bonjour, bonjour. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Bonjour, bonjour. I know that as a Frenchman, you like to put a good stout Bordeaux with a, a nice fine piece of meat and the best guy for steak in, in the area, anywhere that I know of, John Tizar is with us on Wining and Dining. Hello, Wonderful. Jim. How are you? Good to see you, Patrick. Wonderful. Nice okay. to meet you. We have the, the association of the good liquid and the good food. Okay. Yeah. And you can get them both uh, at Knife. and right. uh, Knives. Even, That's what yeah, plural. the Knives, plural. <laughs> hey, John, it's good to see you. You too, Jim. I'm, Always uh, a pleasure to be I'm here. I'm so you. pleased that things are going great, and congratulations on the recent uh, shout-out from USA Today on the Ozersky Burger. Yeah, it's, it, you know, I can't explain it, but uh, the legend of Josh lives on in a large way. He taught me the simplicity of the hamburger, and um, I listened. And we're trying to deliver that to the public for five ninety five, so to speak. Right. You know, it sounds a little self promoting, but it's not. It's really about a good hamburger at a good price that people can relate to. So it's you know, it's it's intellectual yet very simple. <laughs> That's the way to go. Keep it simple and straightforward. We're going to see you do a, a cooking segment that illustrates that in just a moment. Uh, John, for folks who have not been to Knife Burger, mm -hmm. let's go through some of the, the good who, what, where, when, why. And first of all, explain to them why they should come and try the Ozersky Burger and what it what it is, what it stands for, and so forth. Okay, so the, the Knife Burger thing started at Knife. And uh, I was good friends with Josh Ozersky, who was the food editor at Esquire magazine. And during that process, we really spent a lot of time together and talked about what a real hamburger was supposed to be, which is why we call, named it after Josh. Unfortunately, Josh passed away much too early in his life, and it seems like it was a tribute, but it really was something that we were planning to highlight Josh's intellect or love and you know, discerning the hamburger. So I, I took all that information, and we wanted to put it into a fast, casual concept. So a couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember, I had a place downtown, um, the commissary. Mm-hmm. And in, in that, we took a, a wine bar and a hamburger restaurant and kind of fused them together. But I had this, it was during the molecular cuisine revolution. And I had come up with this idea of like kind of sous vide the hamburgers, but I knew that would be too fancy for people who had a hamburger mentality. So we came up with C-Vapping, which is computer steaming the burgers precisely to a temperature because creatine turns a certain color in the beef, which gives you the rare, the medium rare, et cetera. So we figured out at 135 for a period of about 40 minutes, we could steam these burgers and they would be perfectly medium. And then all we'd have to do is just put a little butter on them, salt and pepper, and cook them on a plancha like you would a traditional corner hamburger joint. And we tasted it and it worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was one of those experiments that just paid off. And I think Knife and Knife Burger have been that kind of like mind of a chef into a world of steak and hamburgers that's been taken for granted for a long period of time. It's such a staple in America. People weren't paying attention to it and they were taking it for granted. And I saw a lot of really mediocre steak and a lot of really bad hamburgers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, too many, uh, too many fast casual places out there that uh, were, cas were concentrating more on fast and uh, easy money than uh, even, even fast casual should dictate. But uh, now you've got uh, essentially, uh, you've got uh, the new one in Fort Worth. You've got uh, the, the original uh, Knife Burger at uh, Legacy Hall. Legacy Hall. Front Runner was uh, that amazing food court out there, Legacy Hall. I mean, they've had challenges, but it's really been a very, very um, interesting, valuable lesson and a study of, of the public and how they relate to, to the culinary world, especially this fast, casual model of having 22 different types of cuisine in one complex with a brewery on top of it and an entertainment center attached to it, replacing the, basically the mall in America for people to go and socialize when they're tired of sitting around the house. I mean, basically, that's, it's created the situation, and, and some people get it and some people don't, and, and I think it's a very interesting study out there, and we were able to put the first one there, and we learned a lot, and now we have the second one attached to Knife in Plano in the Willow Bend Mall. So it's interesting that it's in kind of a f another food court situation. Okay, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. May I say something about what you said before, about the way you, you cook you know, your, uh, your burgers? This is superb because, by the way, this is a techni technique that I use myself. Mm. Okay, I'm not a chef, you know, but I learned it from somebody else. And Alain Ducasse, I don't know if you know him. I, I, the, the, the big chef in the world. 
and uh, and this is what you are doing. This is great because you keep the flavor of the food of the the, the meat, which is the main thing. Yes. What happens now, all, all the burgers and whatever, they put so many things there. It, it looks like plastic food. It's no longer the real food you yeah. know, that, that you have on your plate and in your palate because the palate is the one going to decide if it's good or not good. So that's the main thing. And bravo, congratulations, because you are, you are going to the real uh, food uh, cooking, which is the best way to do it. Well, thank you very much. And I, uh, from you, that's a, an ex- tremendous compliment, having created the Madeleine chain and understanding you're one of the first people to understand how to bring quality food to the masses. And that's basically what any fast casual situation is. It's, and now, because the American public has been more educated in food and health or trying, you can insert these culinary you know, things from Robuchon and Ducasse and the history of France and Bruno and Bruno from Cuisine Solutions. You can insert them into fast, fast casual cooking and elevate the experience for the guests without changing any of the price. And it becomes much more consistent. Mm-hmm. And in a troubled labor market, when we're precisely cooking these medium burgers and then putting them on a plancha for two minutes on each side, you don't even need a trained culinarian to really make a great hamburger. It's, so it's been a great lesson. And th- I appreciate that compliment. Thank you. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, b- but as a classically trained chef, I mean, <laughs> you really bring a lot to the table in terms of serving up a hamburger. What's it, what's it like? What's the difference? I mean, uh, you know, just from a chef's perspective, a restaurateur's perspective, from uh, running a fine dining operation to being in a food court like Legacy Hall or in uh, the the new place at, uh, at Crockett over on the yeah. 7th Street, uh, the great Fort Worth location. Well, each one we look at differently because we do try to tailor it to the, to the neighborhood as far as the mentality. But it is still four burgers, four shakes, and one fry. We don't really change it. And it's the Ozerski the pimento burger, a magic, which is a pub burger on English muffin. And then we do a really a plant-based vegetable burger to try to keep it as simple. And getting back to what Patrick said, it's all about tasting the food. Mm-hmm. And that's what Josh had spoke to as well, the simplicity of it. So you would think that a chef would come into a situation like that and want to make everything fancy and elaborate and extremely, you know, soigné, as, as, as cooks would say. But we went the opposite way. It was like an Ozerski should be memory of the first hamburger your parents or your dad or your grandfather ever took you out to on the corner burger store you know corner burger place in your neighborhood like in new york there's a place called joe's jr on the east side i remember going there and getting a you know six ounce burger patty cooked on a plancha by some old guy smoking a cigar on a squishy bun with a thin slice of red onion and two pieces of cheese on top of it there's nothing that gives the, the taste to the thing, the cigar. <laughs> <laughs> back then, they were, they, were, they, they were very lax on the health regulations back then. You could <laughs> I think you could drink and smoke at the same time back then. Yeah, probably so. Yeah, indeed. And, and taste the food for you to make exactly. sure it was good for you. you know? Well, uh, so knife, uh, that's, that's been an incredible success for you in, in the Highland and now Oof. at Willow Bend. And uh, you've, you've really taken the steak to new levels. I mean, because people kind of got complacent about cooking a steak too. I I think that's our greatest challenge even to date. You know, I just came out with a cookbook about a year, year and a half ago called Knife Texas Steakhouse Meals at Home. And it it wasn't the exact book that I wanted to write, but it was my first opportunity. So you work along with the publisher. Mm -hmm. And, And my thoughts in retrospect are exactly my fears in the sense that everyone goes like, they look at a cookbook in particular and say, I know how to cook a steak. I know what a good steak is. But in, in traveling and coming up with the idea for Knife, I learned that, that's, that meat is just as intricate and delicate as seafood or any other type of cuisine or product out there. And that we really do take it for granted. And we do eat a lot of really bad red meat. And then I got into it a little bit more you know, from the intellectual side and, and the sourcing, the treatment of the animal you know, without becoming fanatical about it. And, to, and then to find something purely all Texas-centric in 44 Farms and Heartbrand was really, that was just divine intervention. You know, it's, it's weird how you can come up with an idea as a chef and then you want to, you know, like experiment with it, much like the burgers, sea vapping the burgers. I went around to all the steakhouses and I had some really, really mediocre steaks compared to what I had at like Peter Luger's or Smith & Walensky, which are world-class steakhouses with amazing meat. And I wanted to take that to the next level and, and try to make it all Texas a, on top of it. And 44 Farms was just there waiting to be found. You know? so, and then I w- learned a lot from Adam Perry Lang and other, a few other people about dry aging. 
And I saw the magic of like taking the moisture. As a chef, it made sense to take the moisture and the impurities out of it and concentrate the flavors and add some tenderization to it. And then, you know, just good old barbecue sensibility, salt and pepper, and either cook it slow and low or fast and hot, and there's a great piece of red meat for you. you know? There you go. And if you haven't been to Knife, you, you get a chance to view firsthand what John is talking about in terms of dry aging. You're kind of the king of dry aging as far as I'm <laughs> concerned now. I mean, talk a little bit about that and the technique in case people are Well, th- thank you, Jim. But uh, titles, I, I just like John, you know. I don't <laughs> think. Uh, you know, I like, I'm, I've always had a hard time taking a compliment, but I really owe it to a lot of, you know, just a life as a chef and, you know, going to France and traveling in Europe and learning respect for food and developing a mentality for my parents. I grew up on the beach in, in the east end of Long Island. It was very agricultural, very farm to table, even though I hate that term. Uh, you know, so I, I was aware of like what quality was. And I think that's the first thing that anybody has to understand when it comes to any kind of food product or dining and getting value for your money is you need to educate yourself on quality and not be so caught up on trendy or flashy or new or un, you know, not misunderstood or not understood. I think when people don't understand food, they're attracted to it to find out about it. But then when they find out about it, they move on to the next thing. So it's very difficult to open a restaurant or come up with a concept or follow food in that kind of trendy, you know, modern television magazine way. Because if you don't have the foundations and understand what a good tomato tastes like or what a farmer goes through to get you good lettuce and seasonality and all of these other things, you kind of get lost in this malaise of trendy, popular celebrity chefdom, you know. And I think that's what saved me over the years is that, you know, I am 61 years old now. I've been around for a while. I have a good insight to what works and what doesn't work. And I do believe history repeats itself to a certain extent. But the good news, I think, is that there are more and more people who are looking for great food, for tasty food, for the healthy food, for the what, what we combine all of this. This is more and more people. That the education is coming, is coming back on, on the food. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that uh, a few years ago or a decade ago, it was uh, a little abandoned. But now they re- as a reaction yeah. you know, to the, what I call the plastic food. But a reaction to the plastic food, now they, they discover that the simplest food is the best. For example, I go back to the, 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 the tomato basil soup, but not la madeleine. It's so simple. It's just four ingredients in there. Very, very simple. But it's, it's so basic, and people love it because it's basic, because you, you get the taste, the real taste, the real food. That's true. And John, yeah. I'm sure people who are watching this uh, rather than listening, well, they can even tell listening, would be amazed when you just told your age of 61 because <laughs> you're so vibrant and energetic and you, you look much, much younger than that. And uh, it's it's very interesting. I, that's kind of a lead up to saying you've at this age kind of a, adapted a young man's sport, which is child rearing. Congratulations well, on the you. new baby. Thank you. I have a, a new son. He's nine months old, Nolan. Oh, wow. Um, his mom, Sarah, and I are, you know, we're not married, but we are uh, living together. And I have another son, Ryder, uh, who's eight years old with my first wife, Tracy. So, you know, I have a great life here in Dallas. It's been, it's been so good to me and so enriching. And, uh, you know, it's, it's weird that I came in replacing Dean and had all of the struggles and the challenges of being the next chef of the mansion, our total Creek. And then I just, my eyes opened up after leaving the mansion to the, to the possibilities in the landscape that exist here. Mm-hmm. And you see now, 12 years later, that everybody in the world is rushing to Texas, you know, to try to get a, a piece of the action. But those of us, like Patrick and I, have been here for a long time, so you're going to have to deal with us first before you get here. I tell you, I tell you <laughs> I'm working on a project now, I cannot tell more about it, that Dallas is the heart of the world. This is the best place for living. This is the best place for a bunch of things and so on. It is. Because it is true. It is true. You know, I've, I've traveled the planet or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm in France, but I'm going there all the time. Okay. It, it, no, I'm so happy in Dallas. Everything is, 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 is done here to make you happy. Yeah. This is, this is wonderful. It's a good place to make home base, and it's very family-oriented. You know, I believe that there's a sensibility of spirituality here and some honesty here, even though you may not agree with some of it you know, you just come and experience it. And uh, it's a growing city and places like Plano and McKinney and Fort Worth and Metroplex is just blowing up. So, you know, the quality of life here and the affordability are still, I think will be long intact here, even when the bubble bursts Mm -hmm. for everybody else. 
Well, in uh, in off mic conversations, uh, I have we've talked a little bit about your kids and the interests, and you're you're really participating in their lives. And kudos to you. Oh, I, it's the most important thing to me. You know, I, I had I had a great childhood, and then I was a difficult teenager, and my father was a little older, and he had some complications of health and and habits later on in life. So I always told myself when I was if I was lucky enough to be a dad and I'm actually mature enough and ready to be a dad now that it would be my first priority and you know the blessing of knife and being in the position I am today even though we're still building a company and a brand it's a lot of work and a lot of time my kids come first and my and family is first because I've I've been through those ups and up and down periods in my life in this business and I didn't have those things to lean on back then and it felt very you know sad and lonely so I know that, you know, uh, the restaurant business is fleeting and success can disappear in the matter of an eye. But if you have a family and a foundation and all those things and friends also, then, then you can't lose in life. So that's, uh, I've been privileged to learn those lessons and be able to recreate them over and over again. What were your early inspirations? You mentioned growing up in a, almost an agricultural setting on Long Island. Uh, what, what inspired you uh, to become a chef? I know you trained at Lavaran in Paris and... Uh, have had some uh, and an absolutely amazing background, and we're lucky to have you here in Dallas. Well, thank you, Jim, and I'm I'm lucky to be here because it was it happened at the right time. But my mother was really the catalyst for a lot of things in my life, as far as my passion and sensibility toward food. She was an excellent cook. Um, she was a gardener. You know, we we lived in Manhattan, but my mother had to escape the 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 noise and the, and the oppression of the city. She called it, and she forced my dad to get a little beach house out in the Hamptons. And my dad bought that in the 40s. So we weren't like wealthy people or flashy people in the Hamptons. We just happened to be there, you know, and everything else grew up around me, <laughs> which was a blessing, but a little bizarre for me growing up because like when I was in the city, you know, we were like the upper middle class kid. And then when I went out to the Hamptons, it was like I was the poor kid in the rich neighborhood. So, you know, how to work and do other things. So it, it was an interesting lifestyle and being exposed to those people and the neighbors we had, like the artists and the the playwrights and the you know, the, just the back then, I don't think people realized that the Hamptons was an artist colony, you know, painters, writers, um, they lived there for the solitude and to, to complete their work. And then they would, when they were completed their work, they would come back to the city and live their their life, you know. So uh, that changed over the years and it became a very glitzy place to show off. But I think those sensibilities and being around the ocean and those gardens and those potato farms and broccoli and cauliflower smelling those aromas and, and seeing it come out of the ground and then my mother actually being able to cook it well, it made a big difference in my career. And that really was what laid the foundation. And then my appreciation for, for the French, because I really grew up um, and was raised by French chefs. I was lucky enough to see that kind of attention to detail, um, the rigors and the tradition and the foundations of Escoffier. And that had a great teacher, Gregory Usher Lavaren, who taught me um, about French culinary history which led me to Italy. And then from there, you know, now in this day and age, we're experimenting with Asian food and all types of ethnic food. So I, it started with my mother and it came through New York and then went through Paris and then that, you know, the rest is history. Oh, the rest is history. Right, yeah. Now you hit uh, Dallas, you mentioned this uh, 12 years ago, uh, a hot chef from Las Vegas. Uh, I was working for Rick at RMC Food, yeah. Taking over the storied mansion on Turtle <laughs> Creek. What? kind of resistance you must have faced? What, what, what were you up against there? <laughs> I was an unconscious human being at that point. Because <laughs> in hindsight, you know, I could say it now because I'm in a comfortable position, but when I left the mansion, it wasn't under the happiest of situations or the best of times for me. And I was in Dallas and I wanted to stay and I didn't know where to go. But when I first got there, I was kind of clueless and I was just like enraptured by someone that actually picked me to replace a culinary icon. And probably one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet yeah. in the world. So that's a complex human being to kind of like step into the shoes of because not only did he kind of be one of the creators of Southwestern cuisine and take it to a new level in this amazing place, you know, that was created by the Hunt family and all of this history and part of the, the true culture and, and, and heart and epicenter of what Dallas is, right? So I didn't, I w I didn't pay attention to any of that. I was just like, great paycheck. Great opportunity to come in and kick some butt, right? So we went at it just like that with uh, Shane Krieg. I'm sorry, Shane Krieg was the, was, the, was the GM at the time, and Bob Ballone, who's no longer with us, was the, the CEO of Rosewood, and John Scott. They were instrumental in putting me in this position 
that gave me the creativity and the freedom to know that corporate supported me because they knew that the the inner circles were going to resist. And, you know, I was kind of, I'm a New Yorker and I just went in there and did my thing. And I think what happened after three and a half or four years, there was a recession, there was some pushback. They took the chef's room away from me. And I was outspoken about that. And I went on vacation, someone wrote a letter and then the rest can be almost truthful in D Magazine if you want to read that. I was the most hated chef in Dallas because I had some old girlfriend went on there and called me all kinds of nasty names and it just built like it was, I think it was in the beginning of the internet mm. when people would just go on there and hate for hours. And uh, Nancy saw that like, I think 5,000 people commented and they had never seen that kind of volume of love and hate for a person. So they decided to follow me around for a few days and then set me up to be the most hated chef in Dallas. But it, it's, I turned it around and uh, used it to my advantage. You did. Great magazine <laughs> cover, though, by the way. I mean, uh, looking like you really were working hard on that shift with all the rotten tomatoes thrown at you yeah. or what have you on the D magazine. It was cover. a lot of fun. It was yeah. a lot of, and I, I've had tremendous respect. I miss Nancy Nichols to a certain extent because I really believe that she was a true food critic that understood the history of the city. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I've had this famous feud with Leslie Brenner. and I really don't have anything personally against her. I just think um, much like when I was brand new, Dallas taught me a lesson of like, slow down, be respectful, mm -hmm. understand the culture. You know, I, I, in, a, in a comedic way, I associated to that scene in Goodfellas. I mean, in Casino, when uh, De Niro is talking to Billy Bob about moving the slot machines and, and he loses a big, you know, someone wins a big pot and then he fires him. And then the next day he has to talk to his uncle, the gaming commissioner, about a gaming license. And would you reconsider hiring my nephew back? You know, Dallas has a little bit of, when I first got here, it had a little bit of that old West mentality of like, mm -hmm. you could be good at what you do and you could have a personality and be bold, but you have to kind of play it our way before you get to be yourself. It's kind of like being a Dallas cowboy, so to yeah. speak. Yeah, it is a lot to live up to, but yeah. I think, I think a lot there is, is a little more, very rewarding, a living, a little more living under your belt, otherwise known as growing up helps. And yeah, uh, <laughs> you, you've got a wonderful positive outlook on things now and a lot of success to, to be lauded about. And speaking of that, let's talk a little bit about uh, the top chef uh, because you were really, I think the first chef in Dallas who kind of made the pinnacle and really succeeded well in, in the top chef environment. Yeah, you know, uh, Tiffany and Trey have done really well, but I think, you know, Tiffany sometimes goes more to the entertainment side mm -hmm. and, and she's branding and she makes really great fried chicken. If you, if you ever go out to Legacy, you should check, yeah, that, check it out. And, and Trey has, you know, has had, I think early on, there was a lot more popularity to Top Chef. You know, the first three seasons, there were a lot more viewers. And Tiffany and Trey really, and Casey, have, uh, you know, all been very successful after the show as far as personalities and celebrities. I had a business plan before I went on the show the second time. I learned the first time. It was very raw, and it was something I always wanted to do. I was supposed to be on season one when I worked for Rick at RMC Food, and they'd come to taste the food, and they were like, y you can't be on Top Chef. You should be a judge or something. You know, like It was before Top Chef was really Top Chef, so I can say that now because back then they had a different outlook to it, toward it. Now the more accolades you have, the more accomplished you are, the more struggling, the more unknown you are, the more likely they're th going to throw you in front of a, a television camera. But um, I knew after the first time, and I went out really, for me, I wasn't happy with, the, with season 10. There were 22 of us living in a high-rise apartment in uh, Seattle, Washington, and I didn't realize how difficult the psychological angle was going to play on me from day in and day out. So to wake up every morning with Josh Valentine snoring and Stefan blowing cigarette smoke in my face, you know, it just kind of took me off my game. And, um, you know, having things wrapped in aluminum foil and not knowing what you're cooking with, you know, there, there are certain aspects of Top Chef that I think are funny now in hindsight. But during the first experience, I was just hating myself for being there, you know. Because I thought it was going to be a lot easier. Yeah. And I think, you know, Tom will be the first one to tell you, it ain't easy. Yeah, yeah. That it's, it's, it sounds like Survivor meets, yeah. <laughs> meets, meets the kitchen. But you made a good pal, Sheldon Simeon. Oh, uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, poor Sheldon. I hope, I'm, shout out to Sheldon. I hope he gets better. He just, he burned himself cooking uh, a goat the other day. Oh, I didn't know. So he was in the hospital, but he's, he's okay. But he's opened a, a new restaurant in Maui called uh, Lineage, which is a tribute to his Filipino heritage and um, the traditions of the Hawaiian Islands. And it's great to see, you know, as a surfer all my life, I, I traveled out there quite a bit. And Sheldon and I became friends um, before, during, after the show, and we stay very 
closely. We, we were, we're working on a project in Hawaii that may or may not work out. So that, but that's a long way off. But uh, I, I love the guy. He's probably one of the most soulful people. Uh, Sheldon and Sam Talbot and BJ and a few people on the show helped me be spiritually grounded the second time around. Plus, we were in Charleston, South Carolina on the beach. And uh, that salt air helped. Um, we'd sneak out every once in a while with a flashlight at night and go to the beach, uh, you know. I didn't win, so they can't take my title away from me. <laughs> but that, that helped also, you know, get kind of like we lived across the street from the ocean. And at 12 o'clock at night, once in a while, we could run across and get our toes in the sand and breathe some fresh air and get out of prison. So that helped me the next day. And I also learned a lot about behavior and how the television public of America perceives you rather than who you really are. Oh, yeah. And I, I was a student of that. And I, I, it's who I am. And I have learned all those lessons, but I kind of used it to my advantage a little bit, not, you know, not fighting or disagreeing with people and just kind of putting the blinders on and cooking. Yeah, you there know. you go. You've got a new place, speaking of beaches, uh, and Laguna Beach that's coming up. Oh, yeah, we're very, you know, I've been so blessed, guys. I mean, I really, I, I, I can't explain it to you. As a chef for almost 45 years now, um, this is what Dallas has done for me. You know, a knife had started it, and a knife burger is just another thing. But with our relationship with the Highland Hotel, it was an interstate hotel at, at first after Kimpton sold it. Um, they were so impressed with what we did at Knife that they asked me to do another project. And they gave me a couple of options, and we went out to California. I went to you know, Venice Beach, which really wasn't for me, Los Angeles. I didn't really want to be in L.A. at this point. And Orange County, to me, reminds me a lot of Dallas in the sense that it's the most, one of the most beautiful places. The people are amazing. There's a lot of money there, and the food scene could use some help mm. for the most part, on a large part. There's some good restaurants and some great young chefs, some beautiful, iconic hotels, but the food scene could use a little scrubbing off. So we were offered this opportunity at Laguna Beach, the uh, Marriott Cliffs Resort, right on the, by the uh, Dana Point Arch and Doheny Beach. You make a right, go up the top of the hill. It's this beautiful Marriott that sits above uh, the harbor in Laguna Beach and Dana Point. And we're going to do uh, fresh seafood and dry-aged steaks from Texas, spoon meets knife. And that should be open in April or May of uh, 2019. That's perfect. Well, best big, big, uh, big. Big restaurant or? It's a hundred seat restaurant with a beautiful patio and uh, we're doing all of these um, beautiful accessories to the restaurant. We're adding a, a viewing deck at hotel level. So when you come in, you don't have to enter to the lobby of the hotel. You can walk from Doheny Beach or the Dana Point Arch right up the hill onto this beautiful deck, look out at the harbor and the ocean and then go down to the restaurant. And that's why we called it Outer Reef because the, the view really looks to the Outer Reef. And if you look to the right, there's the Catalina Islands and then to the left is Toto Santos and you know parts of Mexico and the rest of the California Big coast. See you there for the opening. Of yeah. Oh, you guys are invited. Come on out. <laughs> we want to do it. And we were so lucky to catch up with John in his busy schedule for him to join our cast of esteemed chefs, showing us that cooking doesn't have to be complicated and hard work. Keep it simple and straightforward, otherwise known as Kiss Cooking and Chef John Teaser. When you're talking burgers, Knife Burger may be the very best in the whole world. And John, you've got some great ideas for us. Yes, I do. I mean, there's nothing more simple than what we call the Ozerski. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, Josh was a good friend of mine. There's a long story behind this. But the Ozerski is really um, our memory of what the traditional great American cheeseburger is. And anybody can do this at home. And there are a few simple components that are necessary for the home cook. Let's go. But, and they're all accessible at the store. So this is 44 farms. 80-20 ground sirloin. We use this exclusively in our in, in all of our burgers except our dry aged burger. So I just like to, you know, some people believe in smash burger or something. I just like to smush it down a little bit because it does it's so rich from all that fat in there, it will buckle up. So when you push it down like this, it's gonna be a nice even cooking. Now, cooks, a, cooks a little quicker too. Cooks a little quicker. Yeah. We're going to develop a little Maillard by putting some whole butter on that. It's just going to accelerate the process. It's not even for flavoring. It's really to, to develop that crust, that Maillard, the browning quicker. And then, you know, good old Texas spice rub, I call it, kosher salt and black pepper. All right, and then we put it on a really hot plancha. If you don't have a plancha, you can do this in a cast iron uh, pan at home. And we put it down on that side. And then we do no butter on this side, just salt again, and pepper. And we're gonna let that cook probably like four or five minutes on each side. Okay. 
you know, a lot of people like to mess with their meat, you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> what about your burgers here? Uh, absolutely not. Um, I think on the initial touchdown, it's okay to, you know, to, just to make sure you get air and, and the fat is back underneath the burger, so it's my yards evenly. Mm -hmm. But after that, I'm of the school of don't mess with your meat. You know, Ozerski would say that all the time in his Mr. Cutlets videos. It's like, number one tip, don't mess with your meat. So you really want to just cook it evenly, probably about four to five minutes a side will give you a beautiful medium hamburger okay. at this temperature, which is about 400 on a plancha. It, it might uh, be a little faster in a cast iron pan. Yeah. Now, what's the fat content? A lot of people are concerned about too much fat. 80, 80 20 ground sirloin. Okay. And, you know, sirloin is basically the rest of the cow, to be honest with you. So 80% of uh, the animals is pretty much ground up. Right? So there's a base of ground beef, and then we add 20% uh, fat to that. But that's fat protein. It's just that fat or trim from the, from the okay. beef. So that's, that's a good, good enough thing to, to keep it juicy and It keeps flavorful. it juicy, and it still tastes like a hamburger. It's not fatty. You know, like a lot of people love uh, Kobe or Japanese beef because it melts in your mouth. But there's a, to me, there's a fine line between melting in your mouth and still tasting like beef. Yeah. And that's what I think that 80-20 is, is the perfect line for a hamburger. Now, is the 44 Farms, is that grass-fed or corn-fed or a um, They are, it's an alternative uh, feed source. They're fed uh, sorghum, molasses, fermented cotton seed, and some silage. Mm -hmm. So silage is corn, but it's the entire uh, husk of the corn, dried and ground and flaked. And then it's mixed with those other products which are indigenous to Texas. And uh, that's an alternative to the dehydrated corn, which most cattle is fed out at the end with. So the sorghum and the molasses become the alternative sugar source to develop fat. So they got a good nutritious diet, and the result awesome. is a yeah. good taste of burger. This, this by far, I, you know, they don't pay me to say this. This is by far, you see that perfect, this is what you want, those little crunchy exteriors. I, I believe I've tasted a lot of ground beef, and it was necessary for me to have beef that came from Texas. This is the best ground beef I've, I've had. Their, their beef is exceptional, and I think I do believe it's because of the feed program and also the humane uh, lifestyle that they have, because they really raise bulls down there, and then they track genetics, and they partner with other ranchers and heifers, and they all have to be in that same feed program. And mm -hmm. It makes a big difference in the flavor of that hamburger, especially in a day and age where uh, red slime is now categorized by the FDA as ground beef. <laughs> so uh, I'm in the belief of like one cow, one hamburger. I believe in putting butter on, on burgers. You can see that, juice, that burger is juicy, juicy, juicy. All right, now, what really makes it an Ozerski rather than just the great American cheeseburgers, Josh always would put the uh, cheese on top of the burger in the, in the shape of the Star of David. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was an Ozerski thing. Yeah. Ism. Put it under the cheese melter. That's why we call it the cheese melter. <laughs> At, Big fancy cheese appropriately melter. Appropriately named. It's, you know, you can tell we do a lot of melting. I guess you could use a broiler at home. Yes. And they have these little attachments now that you can buy, like a little portable broiler. It's not a creme brulee torch. It's like a broiler that goes on the end of a butane tank. Okay. And it actually works fairly well. Uh -huh. We do we do it on field trips sometimes when we don't have a, when we're doing a lot of burgers and we don't have the time to cover them with a dome or something. You know, like you're in a diner because we're so used to using the cheese melter. And I, I prefer the cheese melter because it melts that cheese. You're looking right at it. You get it right. It's about controlling. So we've taken the random cheeseburger and just put some love and care and you know some passion behind it. So, so there's a, a precision you know to it. I because I like the cheese just to be. It's American cheese and you just want it to get creamy and unctuous. And then that mixes in with the fat and the, and that beefiness of the 44 Farms ground beef. And that's your. It's like moisture on. It's cream on top of your burger. You know, it's like. Have any words for us on the uh, virtues of pink versus non-pink? I'm sorry, I, I, I don't believe that you should eat a hamburger beyond medium. So, but if you do, I I respect your your personal subjectivity. I, I'm not one to tell someone how to eat, but I would s suggest that most beef would be great medium rare to medium, you okay. know, for most people. 
I like to eat some things rare, but even as I've gotten older, I prefer, I think after all the steak I've eaten and all the cooking I've done over the years, medium rare to medium really reveals the quality of the meat. It's a pleasurable eat. It's not cold in the center. And you can really enjoy it and let it sit on your plate and, and consume 10, 12 ounces of, of, of great Texas beef because it's cooked properly and you know you don't have to like eat it so quickly. I think that's important too. That. But that's so you've that's got all great for you, American sir. Toppings for this too. Yeah, traditional. We have these Corsican pickles, and we just use a typical, you know, ballpark mustard, Heinz ketchup, of course, and uh, you can get the French fries plain. These are plain, or we toss them with salsa verde. But have an Ozerski on me this morning, Jim. Enjoy. Friends, come and see John and let him make it for you at Knife Burger or here at Knife, and you can get those great steaks, too. And, John, thank you so much for My joining pleasure. us. My pleasure. Thank you, Jim. Outstanding. Wonderful. John Tezar showing us Kiss Cooking. Keep it simple and straightforward. John, you're a wonderful man. It's inspiring to be with you. I love the fact that you're so appreciative of life and, and you're so grateful for, for your blessings, as you've said. You know, but one of the and down to basic. I'm sorry to to say that, but this is rare to see to see a chef who goes down to the real thing, okay? Because most of the time they try to build up, you know, a bunch of things and so on, and and we lose the the contact with the real food. Well, oh, thank you very much, and I, I agree with you. Basics, you know, it, at a certain point in life, that's all you have is like you, the basics. And I I learned, you know, one of the best things about being at the mansion is I got to meet the Bush family, you know. And even though I, I may be diametrically opposed politically, they're really wonderful people. And my new motto or my new mission statement is from uh, President Bush, 41, is the, you know, his, his quote when he passed away, it, it, it's touched me a little bit. It's just that, you know, you want to live a young life as long as possible. I'm paraphrasing it, but uh, I, I think that's the most important thing. And, and the way to do that is to stay youthful, to stay simple and appreciate, and then life becomes extremely simple. And I loved uh, his uh, statement that, that, that he uh, learned and took with him through life as a naval aviator, Kavu. Yeah. Ceiling and visibility unlimited, and I, I think that's where you are, Shep. Die young as late as possible. <laughs> Thank you, man, for joining <laughs> us. Keep up the good work. Continue Thank you success. very much. <laughs> All right. Jeff I John remember the quote. I'm yeah, <laughs> that's okay. We that's worked okay. our way back around. <laughs> <laughs> Chef John Tizar joining us on Wining and Dining with Jim White and uh, Monsieur Patrick Escalier, of course, with us all month as our guest gourmet and a special episode devoted just to you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us and for your insights. Thank you for what, what you're doing. It's it's wonderful, and I, I love your guest today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I we. I, the best man I know. I had to go with some of the best men and women that I know, and the chefs, that's who we invited. So Wonderful. All right. Hey, folks, remember, if anybody asks you what you're making for dinner, tell them Reservations at Knife with John Tezar. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>